what actions can I take to protect myself from chemicals and medication? So first understanding a little bit about medication, um, you know, not all medications um, are helpful. I mean, as many of us know, um, but many of them are life-saving. And I use quite a few of them in my practice as a rheumatologist um, for lupus nephritis and rheumatoid arthritis. I use all these biologics and, you know, what have you. Thank God they exist because they do wonderful things for, for quality of life. The question always is, is does, do these drugs need to be used right away and reflexively? Now, in an acute situation of someone severely ill, of course, you know, you don't think about kumbaya and some fish oil, you know, but, you know, there are tools that we have that can work in many similar ways to many of the conventional medications with far fewer side effects. Um, and that's really what integrative medicine is, is understanding the properties of, of healthier ways of doing it through diet, through lifestyle, through appropriate evidence-based supplements. Um, and so that's really a critical issue. Now we do know, and I had a whole chapter in the book on medications because I wanted to people to not be fearful of the ones they're on, but to be thoughtful about them and what to ask their doctor and what are the endpoints they're trying to achieve and have they achieved it. Because for example, statins, you know, a lot of statins out there for high cholesterol. Um, we really need to understand who should be on a statin. Should it be everybody or someone who just had a heart attack where it's actually really been shown to be quite beneficial in terms of secondary prevention? Um, you know, not everyone needs to be on a statin because their LDL cholesterol is 10 above normal, 20 above normal, 30 above normal. Why not start with other me me mechanisms? But statins, they're designed to study one endpoint, which is lowering LDL cholesterol. We now know their ripple effect secondary problem is that they raise risk for diabetes they raise hemoglobin A1C. They increase risk for um, insulin resistance, and they're also associated with, um, associated with dementia and early onset of brain in effects. So now you have a drug that's used for one thing and does a great job at it, has results, but now you're trading it off for the potential risk of other things downstream, okay? So that's one section we talk about statins. And then we talk about, um, I talk about drugs that are used for cancers that can often which cancer, you know, obviously you're not gonna mess with that, but you really wanna know what they also have side effect issues for rheumatologic um, components. Why is that? It's because of the way these chemicals are, these drugs are designed. I'm not telling people not to take cancer meds. I just want people to know. Um, we talked about proton pump inhibitors, which are like omeprazole, Nexium, um, designed to change the acid, uh, uh, the pH of the gut. Well, we've evolved for millions of years to have very specific pH of different portions of the gut. And when you mess with that, you change your ability um, to extract nutrients from foods that require a low pH. And proton pump inhibitors raise the pH. So it, it stops the acid production, but we need that acid production to get nutrients from foods. So again, you know, there are known deficiencies, um, B12, magnesium in proton pump inhibitor patients. Um, so you want to see, is there in any other way to handle reflux? Sure. Go to bed without food in your belly. Um, choose foods more wisely instead of fried foods and, and processed foods um, and spicy foods. Change your coffee intake, which can really irritate and cause gastritis. Um, manage stress, which affects the pH level and, and the risk for um, reflux. Um, and then there are a host of, of really well vetted supplements that just cool the gut and soothe the gut. So again, I wanted people to understand the pros and cons of some very common medications and then think about alternatives and really have a discussion with someone they trust in their healthcare world to see whether or not they can do it another way. That is it. Um, so that's really my answer to that is just be judicious about medications because they do have their own risks involved. Um, and why not try the less is more approach just by putting a little work into the lifestyle and supplement aspect. What actions can I take to protect myself from chemicals in my food and nutrition? So this is a really good uh, topic and we talk about it a lot in the book. There's a chapter on detox that I want people to think about is not just getting you know, coffee enemas. I don't talk about that kind of stuff. I don't talk about, you know, 30 day fasts. Um, I really, really try to keep this as sane and evidence-based as possible um, because I want people to understand 
nutrient deficiency. I'm going to talk about nutrient deficiency. The fact that in modern day living, we're not getting the nutrients at the amounts and consistency and regularity and quantity that we require through evolution is because our food system is so poor that even if you say go all vegan or vegetarian and you have great plants that are organic, you know, lots of good produce and fruit and that are organic, they may have traveled six months to get to your local supermarket. They may have been grown in, in, in nutrient deficient soil. Um, they may be sitting in the you know, supermarket for five days and then in your house for a couple of days and by then the nutrient value has dropped. How do you measure all that? You can't. So what I want people to think about is where can we get the highest yield nutrient value from our food? And often it's frozen organics, frozen organics, even in plastic bags, which is not our choice. But frozen organic foods often are flash frozen and they actually maintain a high nutrient level. And being nutrient sufficient, as I coin it, I haven't seen it out there, but I'm coining it as nutrient sufficiency, has been shown to decrease the harmful effects of many common everyday chemicals, endocrine disruptors that get into our body. And I put all those studies in the book and I want people to think about um, things like um, B9 or folic acid and how that's been shown in mouse studies to decrease um, epigenetic changes in, in our genes um, from exposures to methylmercury, to phthalates, to um, uh, PM 2.5 um, air pollution, uh, having enough iron and vitamin C has been shown in children to help reduce exposures to lead. So we have a lot of information about the fact that we are nutrient deficient as a population, myself included, and that not only do you need the healthy foods and clean drinking water, but you need sometimes to even add in certain supplements, which I'm not going to go into because they're very specific, but we really do need some very basic nutrients on a regular basis, including a multivitamin, but it has to be a good one, a clean one vetted, third-party tested, um, has to be a company that really um, prides itself in outsourcing that third-party testing um, and it has no colors and fillers and preservatives and all the junk that typically goes into your typical multi. But that's the kind of thing I like to talk about with patients is how do you take stuff out and then how do you put the right nutrients in that arm you for the exposures that we're always going to be exposed to just living in modern day society. 